A big hello and a very warm welcome to a brand equity special. It's called Modi 3.0, the brand check. I'm Sonali Krishna. Now, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has just finished three years in office and no one can deny that our Prime Minister is a mega brand himself. Controversial, no doubt, but as they say, India consists of many little Indias and different Indias have diverse points of view on what brand Modi stands for. What's interesting is that everybody does have a point of view and that itself makes him a larger than life brand. In 2014, Modi's brand wrote the growing public dissatisfaction against the two-term anti-incumbency of the Congress-led UPA and the promise of Achedin for all, including Indian business. Three years later, we've heard our Prime Minister several times, seen him in constant campaigning mode and also witnessed some audacious experiments. Having said that, today is really about understanding and dissecting brand Modi, looking at the different dimensions this brand stands for. And of course, flashing back to 2014 to look at the values he stood for then and what he stands for three years later in 2017. Has his personal equity hit a new high or is his halo wearing off? And joining me today to discuss and debate this, we have four very eminent personalities. Well, joining me from Delhi, I have Sadanand Dume, the resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Shiv Vishwanathan, the political sociologist, Santosh Desai, social commentator and brand consultant. And joining me from the Mumbai studio is Josie Paul, chairman and chief creative officer of BBDO. Thank you so much for joining me, gentlemen. Well, uh, in 2014, when Narendra Modi was sworn in as Prime Minister, there was a sense of a coronation of a new age. Three years later, my first question to my rather eminent panel is, has that sense translated into reality? Do the Indian masses believe that they have indeed been ushered into Modi's new India? Let me start with uh, Sadanand, who I'm so happy is in Delhi with us today and not in Washington, D.C. So, Sadanand, if I allow you to take this question first, do you think that the masses believe that they live in a new India. I think it's certainly true that the masses believe that they're in, in that the India of 2017 uh, is better than the India of 2013. Uh, and if you just look by voting, which is the best way of assessing the brand of a politician uh, in the way that matters, uh, obviously Modi's band, brand is doing very well. But let me just sort of start this by framing this in sort of, you know, in, in a larger sense with two very quick points. Um, the first is that um, obviously uh, his brand is going to be different depending on whether you're speaking with, you know, someone on the ghats of Varanasi or you're speaking with someone in a think tank boardroom in Washington. So there's that sort of, you know, there's, there's a difference and I hope you'll be able to cover some of that during the course of this conversation. And the second is that there's also a difference between over time, where the Modi of 2002, which is, was different from the Modi of 2014, and is now different from the Modi of 2017. But all in all, to, re to sort of you know, return to your framing question, I would say that going by electoral results, most people are indeed, uh, do indeed feel that brand Modi has delivered something of value to them. Uh, that, that, that's interesting to note, and I will talk about some points that you did actually put forth. But let me just get the get a reaction from my panelists, uh, you know, on this first question. Uh, if I could get you in, Shiv, uh, do you think that the masses believe, uh, d you know, given that all that we've seen on the ground th in the last three years, do you think that they think that they're living in this new Modi's India and this Modi's India is better for them? Well... The way you frame the question, there's very difficult to say no. That's true. <laughs> because I think brand is a narrowing of the imagination. And two, when you refer to the masses, you're not referring to various kinds of minority in other groups. But within the framework of your question, you know, whether you take electoral results or you go out on the street and talk to people, the brand Modi exists. It has a certain value. It's escalating. It's sort of vital and dynamic. And I think to a certain extent, that very notion of change that he keeps building into himself has made him, I think, uh, one of the great plus points of Indian politics today. Right. So, you know, I'm glad you're, you're right, you know, that it's very difficult to give it, say no to this question. That's why I just want to take a look before I come to Santosh and Josie to take a look at all the planks that he seemed to won in the recent past. And I'll come to you uh, with that, Santosh, after I just give you a sense of what I'm trying to say. So he's captured the narrative of caste because he himself, himself is from an OBC community. 
class with demonetization, nationalism, religion, gender with the Beti Bachao campaign, health with yoga, education with a student campaign in monkey bath and so on. Let's also not forget that he's managed to own the plank of the anti-corruption crusader as well as the nationalist plank and interestingly he's also looked at by many as the prime minister who drives the Hindutva agenda. Now, you know, Santosh, if I can come to you, my question is, Arvind Kejriwal was the man first who ran with the whole anti-corruption campaign, but Modi seems to own it completely. Let's not forget that the Congress, uh, you know, is the party that gave us independence. So they could very well have, you know, jumped onto the nationalism campaign, but it is the BJP and Modi specifically who seems to be leveraging, you know, these planks. So your opinion on that? I think it is true that, you know, I think um, certainly Modi is a, is a gifted communicator and, and certainly if you were to look at, uh, you know, the fact that he has kind of, as you said, ticked so many boxes. Uh, but I think the sum and substance of his appeal, I think, lies beyond uh, these individual boxes that he might have ticked. I think there is a sense that while there was a huge sense of expectation in terms of the fact that he would be, uh, you know, bringing forth a a revolutionary radical transformation in the country and while that may not quite have materialized I think the expectation today is the fact that here's a man who has the, the best intentions and I think what he gets a lot of credit for is I think certainly the fact that here's somebody intent on improving things who is serious about uh, the act of leadership who embraces uh, the prospects and the challenges of being a leader and provides a certain clarity, which I think, and strength, which uh, I think is solely seen to be missing in the political scene. So I think while it is true that there are a whole lot of uh, boxes and a whole lot of platforms, and I think we can talk a little more about that, but in an overall sense, if one was to look at uh, Modi, I think you would have to say that there is a certain emotional value over and above everything else that he, that he speaks of, that he seems to have delivered, which is the reason. But I think the most I think the telling thing about him today is that he's virtually got immunity in a sense he can act in a certain way and yet his Im image stays intact and I, that distance between his actions and his image I think is something that is I, perhaps his most singular achievement. I totally agree with you because that was my next point that I wanted to throw to the panel. But before that, Josie, uh, I'll come to you. I mean, you're the man, you know, who's in the business of creating brands. I mean, if you look at, you know, actual ground reality uh, his promises were very large of course he was one leader who made those promises but if you look at the slogans and the big slogan and the big you know the brand messaging that we've seen make in india start up india skill india digital india while none of us actually know the kind of impact it has made on ground and the fact that unemployment was a very very big peg to you know the entire nation and when you look at the labor bureau fifth employment unemployment survey the official unemployment figures have risen from 12.9 percent uh you know in 2014 to 13.2 percent in 2016 but he still seems to be a dream merchant of sorts so explain that to me yeah because the the nature of a brand is that it's not just about the reality it's about the perception first yeah and you know it's the relationship with that perception and in a way, over time, you can make that a reality. So the perception is one of a man who's decisive, who's a transformational sort of leader. He's getting uh, from voters to followers to fans, and that too in such a short time. So you can see that the sentiment of positivity is rising. So the base is very strong, and when the perception and the base is strong, the possibility of action is very high. So I think we're sitting at a at a stage, at a tipping point, where action, behavior, and perception can all come together. Because people are now open and willing, and there are volunteers and fans, so you can make behavior happen quickly. Uh, if I can throw this question to the panelists, to the three panelists in Delhi, saying that, you know, while, you know, on ground, you know, it's, it's a still a little bit of a mystery, even if you look at, you know, demonetization, which was one of his boldest experiments. It's still a mystery as to when the, the you know, how much black money came back. Uh, but the fact of the matter is he changed the narrative very quickly uh, from it being a black money narrative to a cashless economy narrative. And that's smart thinking. But I mean, what, what makes this man still so popular? Uh, Shiv, if you want to take that on. 
uh, I guess I'm not very positive about Modi, but I'll say this much. I think the brilliance of the model is it, it provides a simplified Modi. I'll, I'll, in fact, describe him as a tutorial college prime minister. A lowest common denominator captured brilliantly in a few, the simplicity of a few words. Mm. I think what is more impressive, however, is the fact that there's a certain dynamism to it. And to a certain extent, his very idea of acting out things makes him almost feel that he's a man who's delivering his promises. So to a certain extent, I think this is a simplistic model. Mm. But I think within that simplicity, the message is clear. He's able to communicate, articulate. And that's very impressive. And also, it's very interesting. This is a brand with, I think, the largest amount of silences. And the very fact that silences stay in the background, I find very interesting in terms of the creative brand work of the people who have constructed them. Okay, if I can get you in, Sadanand, on your views on, you know, why this brand is popular. And, and if you could also talk about, you know, diverse groups and their opinions because brand Modi I guess is also not a singular brand anymore and uh, you know holds different meaning and values to different sects of people so if you could just throw some light on what br brand Modi stands for for different SECs and of course different uh, you know religions in this country I mean, I think it's a it's a really interesting question, right? So you know, and I and, and I look at it a little bit differently from Shiv. I think what you know, at least three years in, what you're seeing is that people are not measuring Modi by his uh, actual concrete achievements. They're looking at him by in in terms of his intentions. So, for instance, I was you know I traveled in Uttar Pradesh before the before the state elections and spoke with numerous people. And one thing that you would hear over and over in Hindi was this sort of sentence: "Unki niyat saaf hai." You know, he has good intentions, he has clean intentions, he's a good man. And I think the reason, for that, that's, that's one of the reasons, for instance, why demonetization was received quite positively. People have faith in Modi. Now, you know, his, his fans will say that faith is, ju is justified and his detractors will say that faith is not justified. But the truth is that people do have faith in him. And that is what, so they're, no, they're not measuring him in terms of achievements or outcomes the way your channel may be or the way I might be at a think tank. Uh, right. The question really is, how long will this last? Uh, it has clearly lasted for three years. So we don't know whether it's going to last for you know, six years, five years. We don't know. Now, your second point about how he's seen differently in different groups, uh, I'd say that's certainly true. Now, I write for a financial newspaper. I write for the Wall Street Journal, uh, at, uh, the editorial page. And certainly, if you look at uh, how the views of the international financial press have evolved, uh, three years ago, uh, Mr. Modi was seen as an extremely promising reformist figure who was going to energize the economy by putting in place long pending market reforms. Uh, in 2017, uh, I don't think anybody uh, in the international financial press views him that, that way. He's viewed as much more of a populist figure, much more of a, of a person who is a statist, uh, believes in driving the bureaucracy hard doesn't necessarily believe in market-based solutions and so on. So in that particular group of people, his, br his brand has, in some ways, I would say it has diminished. But if you, look at the, the, if, if you look at the man on the street, he's obviously very popular. If you look at people from minority groups, particularly uh, Muslims, I think that among many people, there are very grave concerns, particularly li li uh, linked to some of the recent incidents we've seen. So I think you're right. I mean, there's a sort of there's an aggregate idea of the brand, which is very powerful. But then if you slice it and dice it in different ways, you do see that it's not the same thing for all people. And it doesn't, it's not uniformly strong among all groups of people. Right. But, you know, my larger question would be, you know, while, you know, the, the delivery on ground, uh, you know, can, can be debated, why is he still popular? Is it because of a lack of an option? Is it because we have no real contender to him? I mean, or are you saying that he's the man who has managed to, you know, understand the pulse of this country best, better than any other political leader we've had? Yeah. Santosh? Well, yeah, meaning I, I certainly think that, you know, uh, like I was saying earlier, I think in some ways uh, the, the connection that he has uh, with, with a large part of the country is, is the fact that there is a great need to find, you know, strength and clarity and there is in the political system there is a sense that everyone is compromised and that there, there, it is a contaminated space and and somebody who rises above it and provides direction and seems to have a plan 
and seems to know his mind is something that, that I think in an overall sense strikes a chord. Specifically then I think the combination of a certain promise for transformation, a certain aura of personal incorruptibility uh, added with I think a very powerful idea of nationalism which I think in a sense has made criticism of Modi and this government extremely difficult because it becomes possible uh, to, to sort of reframe all, all critiques uh, in a way that, that, that they appear to be against the idea of the country or, or, or the interests of the country. Uh, there are many, I mean there are several elements to it. But overall I think the, the, the fact that here you have somebody who is strong, decisive, has the best intentions and has the strength and is not therefore compromised uh, by the political system and can therefore rise above it and, and take the difficult steps even if there aren't that many of difficult uh, decisions that he has taken, demonetization being an exception. But the fact that he has that ability to rise above the fray, I think is a very powerful uh, uh, motivator, I think, for people. Sure, go for it, Josie. Yeah. So just to add to what uh, Santosh is saying, I think he comes through as a very empathetic person because he seems to understand exactly what people are feeling. And so when you, when you look at his solutions, they are not rational in, its, uh, in the way you receive it. You receive it with a high level of emotion. And when you're receiving empathetic understanding with a high level of emotion, you create hope. And suddenly everyone's so much more hopeful. And so that's what connects you with him. And you're saying, I'm going to go with you. You're my Pipe Piper. And you follow like a child. Right. Uh, Sadanand and Shiv, if I could, uh, you, know, uh, you know, ask you, uh, you know, how do you, what, the dimensions of brand Modi today? And, you know, finally, you, I, I just like your verdict in terms of, do you think three years later, his brand has been enhanced or has it been diluted? I mean, and I agree that we have several points of views on this. But, I mean, if you just had to give me one aggregate yes or no, uh, and how is he poised going forward, what would your answer be? Any one of you can take it. Is but your is your question, question what, what I, I what how I view him or is your question of how I assess how others view him how you how you assess the nation views him yeah I think it's quite clear that the nation views him extremely positively they think of him as a person who who provides stability he provides energy he provides dynamism he provides hope and that is the overwhelming feeling um, you know, you have to remember that this is a person who has really stretched the boundaries of the BJP. The BJP was a party which had a very, very you know, barring a few, a few pockets here and there, was not a party that was particularly compelling or competitive in most of southern India and eastern India. Um, now it has begun to make inroads. He is a prime minister who has a capacity to draw a crowd from one corner of this country to the other, even in parts of the country where the BJP may not be electorally significant. I can't rem remember the last time India had a prime minister who could do this before Indira Gandhi, after Indira Gandhi. So in that sense, he's a sort of remarkable political figure. He is a cultural figure in the sense that he transcends politics. He has this cult-like following, which I like sort of liken to the kind of following that, you know, the most passionate Bollywood stars attract, which is that, you know, they can, you know, act in a movie that's a complete dog, but their followers will still come out of that sort of saying that it's the best movie ever. So he's a political phenomenon, there's no question about that. Um, I think in sort of in a narrower sense, I think there's sort of, you know, there are some sort of chinks in the brand, but not in a way that matters if we're looking at it in terms of uh, electoral politics. The chinks though, I'd be, I'd be interested to know. I think there are a couple of chinks. I think that uh, he has uh, certainly been hurt by and the sort of, you know, in, um, among the international, the international financial press by the failure to follow through on admittedly very high expectations. He has not delivered on expectations of being a profound economic reformer at all. Uh, and secondly, I think that there are, you know, genuine concerns about some of his choices, particularly the appointment of Yogi Adityanath in Uttar Pradesh, some of the violence that we've seen and his silence in particular uh, around that. Um, I think that this has in many ways... Um, at least at the margins, resurrected some fears which I think Modi had buried, uh, you know, older fears going back to sort of, you know, the controversies of 2002 and so on. So I think that in, in, in many ways he has, at least for this sort of 
small and admittedly inconsequential elite set of opinion makers. Um, his, his brand is showing chinks. But again, uh, if I were to make that, if I were to sort of contrast that with his, uh, his, his powerful appeal in, uh, the, for the masses, uh, that of course remains undiminished and probably has even been enhanced. Uh, Shiv, if I can come to you, I want to, like, you know, in the last leg of this discussion, want to talk about the challenges Brand Modi will face uh, going forward. Uh, and, you know, in your view on what are the kind of challenges you think this brand uh, is going to face and how should he, you know, look at them? See, I wish I could be as enthusiastic as the rest. <laughs> I think when you say, what does the nation think, in a way you've already determined the answer. Okay, I Shiv, what do you think? In terms of a diversity okay, Shiv, what do you of communities, think? things would be different. Okay, first, <laughs> very simple. If someone, uh, one, I'm worried about the kind of violence that's emerging in the country. And to a certain extent, the legitimation of violence with the appointment of people like Swami Adityanath. Second, I think the way he has destroyed a great amount of plurality and freedom in the university. I'm not making an argument for the university, but I think a university as an institution needs to be understood in a different way. And I think Modi has been desperately unsympathetic to the university. Thirdly, I think to a certain extent, you've got to understand that here is a man who has created perceptions, expectations. I don't, I think we have to look at it from that context. There is something simplistic about this whole worldview. You can call it elitist, as Sadanand said, but I think to a certain extent, there are certain silences, certain ambiguities, certain, uh, there's an overselling of expectations. And I think there's a danger here that it may not work so well in the years to come. But let me say one thing. So far, I think it's been a brilliant game. And even as someone as critical as me has to give him marks, he surprises you. But I don't know how long it's going to last. Because for me, Democracy has to be much more creative than this, but I'll wait and see. Oh, well, Shiv, uh, all points taken, but I just want to go to Santosh and ask him this question. You heard Shiv, uh, and we all know how, what Shiv's leaning in position, position is, but my question is, in today's day and age, do the intellectuals matter anymore? Well, I mean, at, you know, there are more than one ways to answer that question. At one level, you can you know, flatly say that increasingly, uh, you know, the, the kind of the microphone has shifted, in, you know, in another direction. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that even this government for all its, you know, anti-intellectualism cares deeply about the opinions, you know, still and therefore otherwise, you know, this whole constantly railing at, at a few, you know, uh, television channels or a few, you know, what would be isolated voices uh, in the intellectual establishment should not cause it the kind of uh, unhappiness that it obviously does. So, you know, in, in a certain sense, you could argue that in the larger scheme of things, uh, you know, the world over, there is a, there is a, you know, there is a clear reaction against uh, the kind of, the, the power that intellectuals wielded. But on the other hand, in India, there is still, I think, everything is still done with reference uh, to the intellectual opinion. And, and there is still so much of anger that is, the, that is being vented right now that it makes it difficult to believe that they are no longer important. So I think there is a certain desire to prove oneself, a desire to be accepted, which I think is, is extremely powerful and which should not be underestimated. And Josie, I'm going to let you have the last word uh, in terms of what you think the roadblocks for Brand Modi, if any, will be going forward as we hit 2019. I think uh, it's all about uh, walking the talk, right? So. Here's a sort of almost supreme leader who's assumed omni sort of presence and omni brand uh, ship, almost moving towards iconicity. Uh, could be uh, tomorrow a world leader if that talk is walked right through. Because, you know, pro youth, pro women safety, uh, pro poor is all fantastic, right? And, and the thing is, it's really about one word it's freedom. So you're looking at uh, at a man who could give you the second freedom movement, which is, say, freedom uh, from poverty or freedom from, you know, the fear for women or freedom from lack of employment. So I think there's a huge possibility and this rising sentiment can be converted. 
So I feel that while you know the optimism is always seen with a, with some sense of cynicism, I'd like to be optimistic. So I'm keeping myself fully energized. Well, on that note, I mean, I have to say this is year three. Uh, you know, and usually it is this time when the anti-incumbency sets in, but we see no signs of that. Uh, good or bad, the man has managed to uh, somehow manage to keep the imagination of this country captured. Good or bad, we don't know. But uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me today on ET Now. This has been very insightful. Thank you so much. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash etnow.